Welcome back to our discussion about perception. Any discussion of perception has to talk about two processes in your brain, bottom-up processing and top-down processing. And the way I remember the difference between the two of them is in terms of vision. My brain's up here, my eyes are here. So bottom-up processing is when I emphasize the information coming into my eyes. It's data-driven, it's sensation-focused. That information gets processed, but um, the emphasis is on interpreting, analyzing the data in a straightforward way. It doesn't involve cognition, so bottom up to my brain. Top down, I remember, top down is using my brain to change what I see. So going from my brain down to top down to my eyes or my ears or my skin. So top-down processing is when your experience changes your perception. Right? It's, uh, can in, it's context effects, which we'll see in a minute, higher level knowledge, expectations, all of those things change what you see in the world, and we call that top-down processing. Here are some examples of top-down processing. So on the top there, you may see the words, Jack and Jill went up the hill. It's, it's part of a saying, a, a children's, Jack and Jill went up the hill. I, I can't remember. It's a children's story or rhyme, something. Um, anyway, if you look at the word Jill, it looks a lot like gel, or the word went really looks like event. And I don't know if it's hill or hell, but I know the story, I have experience with the story. So when I look at it, I see Jack and Jill went up the hill, but someone who didn't know that nursery rhyme, that's the word, who did not know that nursery rhyme would look at this and goes, might say Jack and Jill event up the hell. Okay, we've already talked about context effects with the 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 cat illustration. Um, there's a similar one on this figure. Um, if you read vertically, you see the letters A, B, C. If you read horizontally, you see the numbers 12, 13, 14. But obviously the B and the 13 are exactly the same figure. How we perceive them, whether we perceive them as a letter or a number, depends on the context, depends on what's surrounding it. Uh, another example in the triangle is the old saying, Paris in the springtime. Paris in springtime is a beautiful place. Did you read that sentence, Paris in the springtime? Read, go stop, take a step, look down and read it. What does it say, Paris in the springtime? Or does it say Paris in the, the springtime? Take a look. That second the was there the whole time. You looked right at it, and you didn't see it. That's something called repetition blindness. We'll get to it in just a second. Um, there's one last figure on here. It looks like a, a bunch of blobs. Um, if you've never seen it before, it's going to look like a bunch of blobs for a while. But if you know that it's that bunch of blobs is actually a Dalmatian, which is a white dog with black spots, um, uh, the full body of the Dalmatian is in there. Um, his head is down below. He's eating something off of the ground. Um, once you see the Dalmatian, you won't be able to unsee it. You'll have the knowledge. Um, but these are examples of top-down processing, when your knowledge influences what you see. I want to go back to Paris and the, the springtime. That's an example of top-down processing. Nobody was expecting for the word the to be repeated so we don't see it. Repetition blindness, we are, it's a kind of blindness to things that are repeated. If you're not expecting them, you don't notice them, which is why it's so hard to proofread your papers. You know what you intended to say, but that doesn't mean that's what's on the page. Um, here's some more examples of top-down processing, um, primarily context effects. So let's look in the upper right-hand corner. Um, there are two circles 
that are each surrounded by a number of other circles. Now the center circles, do they look to be the same size to you or does one seem to be a bigger circle than the other? Mm, to me it looks like the circle on the left is larger, the circle that's surrounded by the small circles. Right? It's because size perception is relative. How big something looks depends on what's around it. So if something's surrounded by small things, it looks bigger, then that same thing looks when it's surrounded by bigger items. Right below that are some, I guess you could say, it looks like center surround receptive fields, but uh, embedded circles. In the middle of each of those circles, there's a black circle and a white circle. In the middle of each of them is a gray circle. Uh, which one has the darker gray? I'm going to say it's the uh, gray circle in the white circle. Do you see that? Do you see that gray circle on the right? It appears darker than the gray circle that's surrounded by black. It's another context effect. They're actually identical. Uh, here's something similar uh, on the right called white's illusion. You can see some horizontal stripes, black and white stripes, and there's some vertical bars. Do those vertical bars look like they are the same shade of gray? No, but they are exactly the same color. It just depends on whether there's each, the perception of each one depends on whether that bar appears to be part of a darker um, figure or a lighter figure. Um, I'm going to show you now. I'm going to take a little break and show you a video that is really powerful on context effects. You see that checkerboard, um, and there's a there's a cylinder that's casting a shadow on that checkerboard. You notice that two of the squares of the checkerboard have a little squiggle on them. One of them uh, is an A and one of them is a B, but it looks like one of the squares is dark gray and the other one is a light gray. And I'm gonna show you in a second, this is not true. Come right back. Okay, here you can see the same checkerboard that I was displaying on my slide and it's got a shadow being cast on it. And this woman is going to move a piece of paper in and out of that shadow. So here it goes. Remember those two squares I told you are exactly the same color? Well, now we're going to prove it. Watch her move that piece of paper out of the shadow and onto a different square of the board and it goes, appears dark, green, dark gray. She moves it back, light gray. It's the same piece of paper. Here it goes again. Light gray, now it appears dark gray. Dark gray, now it becomes light gray. The same piece of paper, exactly the same piece of paper, appears to have different colors in the same, in two different contexts. Wasn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. That link is in your Canvas webpage so you can show it to other people. Okay. Um, Top-down processing is also used to understand language, and we'll spend uh, several lectures talking about language, um, but I'm just going to give you a brief example here. If I say, eats, shoots, and leaves, he eats, shoots, and leaves, well, there's two entirely different ways to interpret eats, shoots, and leaves. One of them could be in terms of a cowboy, there's a cartoon there of Clint Eastwood pretending to be a cowboy. And when you see it in that context, you think, well, Clint Eastwood had a meal, shot somebody, and left. Uh, next to that is a panda bear. And if I say eats, shoots, and leaves, and I'm talking about a panda bear, you're thinking, oh, the panda bear eats, shoots, and leaves of bamboo, right? It's not shooting a gun, it's what he's eating. So context, top-down effects, uh, play a big role in our ability to understand uh, language, what other people are saying. Top-down processing also plays a big role in the perception of pain. Now, early models of pain perception were not top-down at all. They were strictly bottom-up. Bottom-up meaning they emphasized what your sensory organs said. 
Um, uh, they emphasize the importance of this particular kind of pain receptor and the pain receptor sent signals to the brain. And if the pain receptors were sending a lot of signals to the brain, then you would experience a lot of pain. If the pain receptors were not sending many signals to the brain, then you wouldn't experience much pain. Those were early theories of pain perception. But we now know that's not really helpful or accurate. Uh, modern theories of pain perception are highly top-down process. Um, they emphasize the role of expectations, attention, um, distraction. If you have to take your child to get a shot, say a vaccination, um, if you tell the child, oh, it's really going to hurt, look right there, that's where they're going to inject you, right there, look, pay attention to that, it's really going to hurt. Well, it will hurt. But if you tell the child, nah, it doesn't hurt, and you talk to them, you distract them, you don't have them pay attention to them, it, it will hurt less. Those are top-down processes. And I want to talk just for a minute about the placebo effect, because the placebo effect is a strong demonstration of top-down processing. A placebo is a pill or a treatment that is not harmful, but has no benefit. Imagine if I gave you a sugar pill, a pill that didn't have anything in it. Um, it turns out placebos have a huge impact on our perception of pain. You may have noticed that if you're dealing with a small child, children fall down all the time, they scrape their knees. What's the first thing they do? They look up, look around, they're looking for you to interpret the stimulus. But let's say that they're crying and they really hurt their knee. What do you do? You say, oh, come here, baby, come here. Let me kiss your knee or rub your knee. Look, kiss, kiss, boo-boo, I made it all better. Your, your boo-boo's better now. You can go back and play, right? That's a placebo. Obviously, kissing a scratch doesn't change anything, but it makes a child feel cared for and loved, and that is enough to reduce pain. Let me give you some medical examples. There was a study once of some uh, cough medicine that's commonly sold, and they did a very careful study to find out how much of the effect of the the effect <laughs> the effect of the cough medicine was from the placebo effect, and how much was actually from the active uh, ingredient in the medicine. And it turned out 85% of the effect of cough medicine was due to the placebo effect. Now, some people think, oh, you're just a weakling or something if you experience the placebo effect. No, 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 no. Do not dismiss the placebo effect as just something in your mind. Of course, it's something in your mind. We only experience things that are in your mind. But um, down on the bottom are two brain fMRI images of people who are, well, of individuals who are depressed. And these were brain imaging studies looking at the impact of a particular antidepressant on depression and brain activity. Um, you can see on the picture of the left is someone who got a sugar pill, no antidepressant, um, but they thought they were getting the treatment. And you can see where the activity is in their brains. Compare that to the brain of the individual who actually is on an antidepressant. The patterns of activity are very, very similar. A lot of the effect of antidepressants comes from the placebo effect. But don't use that to dismiss them. They work. The mechanism is placebo effect, but it works. Just look at the brain, okay? All right, that's it for top-down processing. Come back and we'll talk about unconscious inference. <laughs>